Time, but good morning, Central Still. Are you okay there? Yes? Uh, yes, I'm okay, Pastor John. <laughs> okay, good morning, Central. Good morning, yes. Are you ready to receive God's word for this morning? Yes. Are you ready to have a conversation? Right? I reckon um, in the 21st century, the preaching of the word is more, should be more of a conversation, more than the one way kind of thing you know it's always like the pastor is like telling and then we expect the people to receive but i think here at central we we want you to have a space for you to express yourselves we want you to to be able to engage in whatever the pastor is preaching because come to think of it you know like pastors are flawed right pastors are not perfect and every time we preach on sunday you better check you better check you know like what we preach to you because we may be spewing wrong messages of course hopefully not right but that 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 is the responsibility of uh, men of god ministers to when when they preach god's word to you you as a receiver of the word should be responsible um to 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 research to go back to your bible and to to ask yourself did did what i hear today is it is it valid or is this something that is relevant um to me four weeks ago we made some recap Brothers and sisters, on the meaning of discipleship, if you remember that, we're doing a series, and four weeks ago, um, we said, you know, like, the definition of discipleship is this, and this is based on almost like three years of conversation about discipleship in this church, in this congregation, in the Cantonese congregation, the Mandarin congregation, all the congregations are talking about discipleship. And I've given you some insights on what discipleship is, but maybe we could spend this time a bit. You know, like, what is discipleship to you? If there's one word, okay, or a phrase, or an essay, if you want to, to say that, what do you think is discipleship to you? And then I'll go back to what we, uh, we proposed, you know, like four weeks ago. This is more of like a review um, of, of, of our conversation. What do you think is discipleship? Anyone? You can shout it out. Okay. See, this is the conversation that I'm talking about. (laughs) What is discipleship? Or if you cannot answer what is discipleship, what is discipleship not? You know, like what? This is not discipleship. This is discipleship. Anyone? Discipleship is where we believe. It's believer. Discipleship is? Every disciple is a believer. Okay, every disciple is a believer. So, yeah, so you remember that. Um, So so the, the proposition, every disciple is a believer. Okay, any more? Okay, discipleship is loving loving other people. Thank you so much, sir. Discipleship is fellowship. Okay, there you go. Discipleship is doing good works. Okay, no right and wrong answers here. Okay, so don't be afraid. I'm not going to give you like a 75 or like 60. Kind of great. I, I just want I just want your feedback about what discipleship is. Because come to think of it, if we've been talking about discipleship for, for three years, surely we have an idea of what discipleship is. A lot of responses from there. What about from here? Discipleship is? Obedience. obedience. Okay, discipleship is obedience. Any more? Maybe one more, and then I can proceed with my... Yes. Okay, discipleship is learning, right? Or like a learner. A disciple is a le- learner. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those responses. So what we said last time, four weeks ago, we said discipleship is not a program. Okay? Discipleship is not a program. It's not a course. It's not a seven-year cycle seminar, Bible study that you do. That is not discipleship. Discipleship instead is a developmental process. So that means as you go through discipleship, you actually develop. And when you say you develop, that means you grow, right? Do you remember the Sunday school song, read your Bible, pray every day, and you grow, 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 right? That's the expectation, that you grow, 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 and then it goes higher, that you grow, grow, yeah, but anyway, out, out of tune. But that's, that's how it is. There is an expected development. The same way you go to infant school or junior school or middle school or senior school, you are expected to transition from one state of being a student to another. And then you become, um, you know, a university student if you'd like to, to, to go through that process. Discipleship is a lifelong journey as well. 
Okay? I think this is the pressure of the intentional discipleship programs that we hear because we are so pressured to become a disciple and to produce results. But we do realize that discipleship is a lifelong process. It doesn't mean, though, that, you know, like, you're like 85 years old and you haven't really progressed. You know, that there is an expectation of growth and development. However, we do recognize that discipleship is a lifelong journey. And discipleship is a way of life. And this is what we said. Every believer is a disciple and every disciple is a believer. Do you believe this? Do you think this is true? Can we say this with conviction and, you know, like with full acceptance? One, two, three, go. Every believer is a disciple. Every disciple is a believer because you cannot be disciple if you're not a believer. This is in our context, okay? As Christians. Because you know what? Discipleship is not an exclusive process for Christians. There are people in the world out there from different cultures, and different civilizations that they have the discipleship process as well. So you have your teacher, you have your students, you have your mentor, you have the people that you try to develop. So it's not exclusively Christian. It just so happened that this outstanding man and God, okay, the Lord Jesus Christ, exemplified in his life the discipleship process. Because I reckon in terms of an example of a discipleship process, Jesus calling people to become his disciples has actually transformed the world you know like there is that intentionality that he called followers because he's not going to be there forever he's going to die to sacrifice himself however the message of the gospel needed to continue and so therefore he called disciples he called followers but this is not exclusively christian and it's not exclusively new testament because we said in the Old Testament, there are disciple-discipler relationship as well. So examples would be Moses and Joshua. We have Elijah and Elisha. And then if you look at Yahweh, okay, you pronounce it as Yahweh, right? Um, and his people, God is the discipler. God is the one training. God is the one guiding. God is the one helping transform his people. Still with me? Yes, I'm just giving you the... This is the conclusion of the series. So we're, we're just going back um, to that. So this is the premise of our series, really. In the name of the fathers, following the discipleship journeys of the patriarchs in Genesis. Because we say that these men... Okay, patriarchs means fathers, right? These men were called by God to fulfill His purpose. They were under His guidance as they followed God. They're not just God's servants and people. They're actually God's disciples. Right? And so we have studied three patriarchs already. Abraham, Isaac, it's the third one. Jacob, okay, and then today we will be studying Joseph, right? But their discipleship journeys of these men may be different from the way we brand discipleship in this day and age. Theirs is different. Theirs is a lifelong journey under the guidance of our God. Their discipleship is lived out daily throughout their lives they never followed a rigid program they didn't they didn't feel the pressure of discipleship they were not perfect and yet they fulfilled what god called them to do and so let me bring it back to you guys isn't that what we want to do as disciples of jesus christ right we just want to follow and obey what jesus commanded us it's the same for these guys in the old testament okay it, it, do, do you get where your pastor is coming from? Because we are so used to a program or like a pathway to discipleship. I would like you to see your discipleship as a way of life so that you don't, you're not two-faced, okay? So that you don't say, okay, I'm wearing a disciple's hat now and then later you can put it down. Okay, I'm not a disciple of Jesus Christ. I can do whatever I want. Or like, oh, it's Sunday now. I need to wear my disciple's hat. And then when you go home, you put it down. I just want you to see that actually when you encounter God, when God deals with your life, He deals with your life 24-7. Right? 
so that the discipleship process is not something that was imposed to you by Pastor John by a D1 to 1, right? Probably what you're saying is, what about D1 to 1? Is it not a process? Yes, it is, is, isn't it a program? Yeah, yeah, it is a program, but it's integrating you into a discipleship lifestyle. D1 to 1 brings you to a certain point, and then you're off you go to live out your full discipleship. So in a way, it's like evangelism slash discipleship. For those of our visitors, D1 to 1 is our way of introducing you into a life of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if you're interested with that, talk to me because we're gonna, I'm going to journey with you, you know, like for eight weeks and, and, and bring you into that um, space. So we said if the life of Abraham could, could be captured in like tabloid formats of news, right? Because it's so scandalous that it's worth it. For those of you who, didn't, who weren't here to, to receive that message, it was, yeah, it was a pretty interesting take um, in the life of Abraham. And then if Isaac could be summarized, you know, into some boring paperbacks, um, basically, and we did, we did this, um, you know, like um, three weeks ago. And we said if Jacob could be like a reality show, right? Jacob's life is one big reality show. And towards the end of life of Jacob, when he started having kids, I told you that it's almost like keeping up with the Kardashians, right? That's, that's, how, that's how his life is. Then what do you think Joseph's life could be? Okay. Any guess? So we have exhausted, you know, like newspaper and then books and then TV. What could the life of Joseph be? Anyone? <laughs> okay. Joseph's life is a musical, right? It's a musical. <laughs> okay? Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat is a Broadway musical with lyrics made by Tim Rice, the one who did Aladdin and Be um, Beauty and the Beast, and music by Andrew, Andrew Lloyd Webber, you know, the composer for Evita and the Phantom of the Opera, right? Familiar? Right. Now, Joseph's life has also been made into a Christian cantata called The Dreamer. For those of you who lived in the 70s and the 80s, you know this. The Dreamer, performed by the Continental Singers. It is one big cantata, and during my growing up years in the, the 90s, it was converted into a Christian musical. Full, because cantata is a bit boring, right? They just stand there and then they just sing. So they made it into full-length musical and it became one of the longest running Christian musicals in the Philippines. It's called Joseph the Dreamer. Now Hollywood capitalized on the popularity of Joseph on stage that they made an animated film. And this is DreamWorks production of Joseph the King of Dreams. They're the makers of what movie, do you reckon? Huh? Anyone else? Many nights I prayed. Yep. Where no proof anyone could hear. So it's Prince of Egypt, right? The, from the creators of Prince of Egypt, they made Joseph King of Dreams. However, critics didn't like the film as compared to Prince of Egypt. Prince of Egypt was controversial because it kind of deviated from the biblical narrative, right? And so the, the critics panned um, this, this animated film, even though it was lovely, because it was so too faithful. It was too faithful to the biblical narratives. And so it was shown straight to DVD, right? So if you, <laughs> it wasn't shown in the cinemas, it was panned by critics, but you can, you can catch it um, in the DVD. And later, later reviews actually were more gracious um, to the musical because it, it was wonderful. And I've seen it, and you can grab a copy of it. You can show it to the kids in Sunday school. It was really good. So, so that's how it is. Um, now, Joseph is indeed the king of dreams, brothers and sisters. And that set him apart from his brothers. But it's not just because of the outrageous dreams that he had. And these dreams are from God, right? And they came true. But it's because he is the favorite son of his father, Jacob, right? Why? Because his mother is none other than Rachel, the one true love, okay? The one true love um, of, of Jacob. And then as, as if being favorite is not enough, Joseph was given a coat of many colors by Jacob, which made the brothers plan to get rid of Joseph. So what did they do? They plot, um, you know, like 
They plotted to kill Joseph. However, with an intervention of an older brother, Reuben, it prevented Joseph's death. Now, instead of Joseph dying, Joseph was sold by his brothers to Ishmaelite slave traders. And in Genesis 39, as was read this morning by Nat Kong, it begins with this. Joseph has been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials and the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So today's message is about that portion of Joseph's story. Before his captivity to become um, a slave, that was colorful enough. And then afterwards, it's even more colorful because you have issues of bitterness and unforgiveness and rage. But we're not going to go through that. We're just going to go through this low point in the life of Joseph when he was taken uh, to become a slave um, in Egypt. So let's begin. Um, okay, can I have the next slide, please? There you go. Can we read this together, brothers and sisters? One, two, three, go. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of an Egyptian master. And if you read chapter 39 of Genesis, this is a recurring statement. Every time the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph and therefore he prospered. Okay? Now, this is not a, a key verse for prosperity gospel, right? You know, like people would say, you know what? If you do this, then therefore you will have a car. If you do this, you will win a lottery. If you do this, you will have a big house. No. The key here is the presence of the Lord. It's not what Joseph did. It's just the presence of the Lord in the life of Joseph that made him prosper. Now, come to think of it, he's a slave. He was a slave at that point in time. How could you prosper as a slave, actually? Maybe he was treated well. Maybe he didn't have a disease or something. Maybe he, he you know, like... Um, yeah, he was fed well. But at that point in time, according to the biblical passage, he prospered. He thrived as a slave, which is oxymoron, right? Suffering and then prosperity. But that's how it is. And this is what we would like to highlight here. Joseph being himself and being under the presence and the guidance of God, you know, when he stood for what he believed in, and I think even at this time, he meant well. He followed God, um, he was misunderstood by a lot of people, but God has been dealing with him every time. But he stood up for God, and standing up for God ushers blessings in your life, right? And I'm not talking about material blessings here. Joseph didn't have a car. Joseph didn't have a condo. Joseph didn't have, you know, like a million dollars, 150 million, right? Last, last, last lottery. Did you see the queues like in town hall and everywhere? It's like winding. A lot of people wanting a lot of money. The blessings that goes with it as a slave is that, you know, it's well-being, right? He was just healthy. He was just strong. So that's, 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 that's how it goes, brothers and sisters, right? Now, how, how, how do we support this? See, this is what happens when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in the eyes, in his eyes, and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything that he owned. Look at that. You know, Potiphar saw, okay? He saw that the Lord was with Joseph. See? His faith and his relationship and his life under God is visible, right? It is very, very visible, and it produced a lot of results. And what, did, what happened after that? From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian. So this is like prisons of God in the life of this man overflowing to his master. And now that he's being given the chance to rule over the household, the blessing overflowed once again. Again, is it because Joseph gave his tithes? 
you know, like faithfully, like he gave money to God, or that he, he did a lot of things. No, it's because of the soul presence of God that everything falls into place, and he was blessed by God. Potiphar left everything that he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except for the food that he ate. So what's the second point here, brothers and sisters? See, if you are a follower of God, and let, let me bring you now to you being a, a disciple of Jesus Christ, right? People should see Jesus in you. People should see God in you. Right? Are you with me? Right? God's image should be seen in you. Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph. And that's what I want to bring to us. See, discipleship is not a label that you wear. It's not a hat that you put in your head. Or like a mark on your forehead. 666. No, that's, that's different. <laughs> that's different. You cannot say, okay, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Okay, blazy kids, right? I see your nice hoodie. It says, what? To be the salt and the light of the world. Wow. That's very noble, right? Question is, are you, are you the salt and the light of the world? That's a challenge for you, okay? That's a challenge for you. See, you can wear that label. But how far will that label go? So the point here is that standing up for God makes for a great witness. See, this is where the intentional discipleship comes from. Because if you are a believer in Jesus, people will see Jesus in you. And even without you opening your mouths, because a lot of you are like, oh, not unless you share the gospel. Not unless you share the gospel, the people won't know. No. People will just look into you and the way you live your life, and they will see who Jesus is. Now, if you represent Jesus badly, then that's the sad thing there, right? Because people will not read the Bible. People will not read those tracts that you give them. If you give them along George Street, it will go to the next rubbish bin. But people will see you, and you are God's representative. Can you look at the person beside you and see Jesus in them now? Do you see Jesus there? Yeah? Hopefully you do, right? Because the world will not read the Bible, but the world will read you. So if you confess to be a Christian, it should be that way. And that's the entry point, right? I had this weird, you know, I was thinking of an illustration for this. It's like, how, how do I illustrate this? It's almost like, okay, uh, Lizzie's here, the closest. Like, so someone looks at you. It's like, you know what? You look like Jesus, actually. <laughs> and they're like, can you tell me? <laughs> you know, like about, and I was like thinking of that illustration. Like, that's a bit creepy. That's really creepy. But it should be that way. When people see you, they see something different with you. That they're kind of interested to know what makes you different what makes this person different from the rest of the crowd that somehow you know like i'm gr it's, it's not physical attraction definitely but it's something that 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 people sees in you and 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 that's that's how it is i don't think the slaves joseph as a slave could 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 share to his master and it's like you know what I know Yahweh, we're close, you know, and he's giving me a lot of dreams and blah, blah, blah. And my dad knows him too. You know, I have grandfather Abraham. No, he, he doesn't have that access <laughs> to Potiphar. But Potiphar saw God um, in, in Joseph. Okay. Now, time for some bit of drama. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. <laughs> so that was weird. But anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the representation in the cartoon actually is a bit scrawny. And then she's like really big. But yeah, she can really overpower Joseph. You know, like that's how it is. But in verse 10, um, it says, this is what, what the Bible account is. But he refused 
He said, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. So Joseph is actually in a position of authority there, right? He's, the, he's almost the, the right-hand man of the guy. So could the Potiphar's wife take advantage of this guy? No, he's actually powerful, right? So safe space, no issue, right? <laughs> no, sorry, I'm just getting distracted there. But anyway, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Okay, I like that last line because it's like he's not just being practical here. Okay, this is this is this is his responsibility really. Um, And his responsibility dictates that actually he should act accordingly to your response to what you're responsible of. But then he recognized that such a suggestion by the wife is a wicked thing. It's a sin. It's a sin against God. And only a man of God will realize that. Because come to think of it, there's so much temptation and pressure in that role. Because he's powerful, right? He's powerful more than anyone else. He could silence the servants and tell them, don't say anything. Okay? I'm your master, secondhand to the master masters. And then plus, oh, the wife is powerful as well. He could have played it that way, like soap operas, right? You know, like affairs, you know, like that kind of thing. But he said, no, it's because God is with him. And, and though she spoke to Joseph day, but a bit, a bit desperate here, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, could you imagine that? You know, like, Joseph, Joseph, come to me. You know, it's like, really? You know, like that kind of thing. Um, he refused to go to bed with her. This is, this is something, okay, for young people. How do you protect yourself from temptation? Okay. He refused to go to bed, which is the bad act, the bad temptation, but he refused to be even with her. Okay. So don't play with temptation. He refused to be in the same space as the girl. So you don't say, oh, I'm a strong Christian. I will go to this pub. I'm just going to look around, you know and have my drink. I don't really care what people are doing, but I'm going to share the gospel. Right? (laughs) That kind of thing. No. (laughs) Because if you put yourself out there, then the tendency for you to get enticed is even greater. Or like, you know what? Uh, This sister is like really, you know, like she's leading me on. But I do care for her soul, you know, so I just need to be with her. You know, just share the gospel to her so that, come on. Get away. Get away from her. Like a thousand miles if you can. So that you won't be enticed. You won't be tempted. For those of you who are struggling with sin, it's not just, you know, like male-female relationship. Gambling, for example. You said, no, I'm just going to go to the star. You know? And then just eat. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but if you're like, oh, there. Cha-ching, cha-ching, you know, like you, you'll hear the sound of the slot machines. You know, they'll be like... There's no way for you to say, I'm going to be strong here. See, this is very practical. And Joseph is a practical man. Oops, sorry. Um, Joseph is a practical man, but he's also aware of the spiritual um, aspects of what he's going through. So Joseph is basically operating in God's power. This is not his strength. It's the power of God at work in Joseph, with Joseph. And so, therefore, standing up for God builds the character. The more he subscribes to the power and the will of God, the more he can withstand whatever temptation that comes um, his way. So let's just continue. We're almost done here. When the master heard the story, um, his wife told him, saying, this is how you slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's masters took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now, this is a time where um, in the movie, you know, like Joseph, um, King of Dreams, you know, they have this massive ballad um, called um, You Know Better Than I. Because after his experience of being betrayed by the brothers and being sold to Egypt, he thought, everything's going so well for me in my life now. And then, boom, he's back in prison. And sometimes we do feel that way, right? Sometimes we thought that, okay, 
I have had so many difficult experiences in my life, and I believe God is giving me a second chance here. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, boom, you know, it hits you, right? It just hits you out of nowhere, like an asteroid from space, boom, annihilating a planet. And then you ask the question, why? And that was, was going on in Joseph's life, really, right? Out of the blue, out of nowhere, you know, and this is my personal, my personal um, testimony here. Still, sorry, give me a one year to talk about my surgery. It's going to be every week, right? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> because I thought we went through some tough times in the international congregation in 2017 and 20, 2018, actually. It's when the massive exodus happened, you know. And so I felt like, oh, wow, 2019 is going to be a great year. And things have been picking up. You know, like things have been picking up like the first quarter of the year. We're recovering in terms of our numbers. And then we have a student pastor coming in. And then, boom, out of nowhere, I bled. You know, and I'm like, what? What is this? And I was like in that kind of situation. And when you find yourself in that situation, brothers and sisters, you don't have a choice but to just entrust your life fully in the hands of God. You're so powerless, you don't have any more control of things and circumstances. This morning when Julia walked into the church and I saw her, sorry, I need to say this, I saw her and I was like, she's so happy. And what did I say? You know what? I almost died. And if, if I died, I wouldn't have seen you again. You know, that kind of thing. So emo, right? But that's how it is. And I'm like, but that... Things could have gone, you know, like south. But that's, that's how it is. And so at this point in the life of Joseph, he's just basically, and this is the way God had to deal with him so that he would entrust his life to God fully. Now, standing up for God would require a lot of sacrifice from you. So it doesn't mean that you're on a winning, winning streak, right? It's like, whoa, you know, God, we're doing this, we're doing this. Then boom, out of the blue, something happens. What are you going to do? Are you going to curse God? Are you going to say, this is so not fair? No. Because you believe in the sovereign hand of God to keep you there. And I think that's what kept him there. Because it took another, what, three years in the dungeon before he was summoned by the Pharaoh so that he can interpret the dreams. So it's, it's, it's a lot. It's like, wow. You know, like, how, how do you expect that to happen? But just be ready for the inevitable. See? And this is, this is again, the, the pitfall of the prosperity gospel thing. What if the blessings run out? What if you're not in a good position anymore? Are you going to praise God in your illness? Are you going to praise God in defeat? Are you, are you going to praise God in troubled relationships? Are you going to praise God when, when things are really bad in your life? Because when you're able to lift up holy hands when your heart is really down, right? That is faith. And that is true worship. But if you can only lift up your holy hands and be happy when everything's fine and everything's good and you have your work and you have your health and you have your good salary and your family's intact, then maybe, I mean, I'm not saying you don't celebrate those. Those are still blessings from God. But just be mindful that all of these things could be taken away from you. And when that happens, what do you do? Right. Are you going to be angry? I was telling that with my family, you know, like, Tess and I were, like, talking about celebrating our anniversary, and I was like, oh, maybe we should, when, when it's our 25th year anniversary, then we can, uh, we, can, we can travel, you know, like, and then we realized that actually next year is just going to be our 18th. And then Tess all of a sudden said, 25 years is a bit too far off, right? <laughs> and then I said, okay, okay, let's, 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 let's plan again, maybe next year. But next year is like Ains HSC, you know, like that kind of thing. So it's like, why do we need to revolve around the children anyway? It's my life, right? <laughs> no. So, so, so we, we just realized that we just, we just need to be thankful for, 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 for that moment. And then I was telling my children over dinner, because this, this conversation was going on throughout the day, and I was telling them that, you know what? If God takes me away, I mean, if it's time, then I said, don't be angry with God because he has given us already a bonus, right? So everything from that on time forward is already a bonus 
so you should not be angry with God. And I was, I, I don't know if, if it filtered, you know, like, um, if they understood it. But that, and then Tess was like, don't talk like that. And then she started, like, you know, getting emo about it. <laughs> you know? But I said, but that's the truth, right? We can only thank God. We cannot, we, we cannot just be thanking God for the good times. We should be ready to thank God even when it's really, really bad, right? And so, to conclude this, but while Joseph was there in prison, again, we are back with the same line. Can we read this red thing? One, two, three, go! The Lord was with him, and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison wards. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those he held in prison. He was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. Because, let's read this again, the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Um, if you have attended the Catholic Church, they always say, the Lord be with you. And then they respond, and also with you. I think this should be in our minds every time. A reminder to our brothers and sisters that actually the Lord is with you. Can we say that to, a, to the person beside us right now? Brother, sister, the Lord is with you. So what's the response? Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so standing up for God actually produces success. Again, what's the measure of success? It's not probably the success that we know, but it's the success that is according to the will of God of God, right? So as we wrap this discipleship process, take away from Abraham, I felt like discipleship is obedience and perseverance, right? With Isaac, discipleship is embracing the faith. With Jacob, discipleship is an everyday struggle and transformation. And with Joseph, discipleship is just really standing up for what you believe in. And that's how it is, right? Let us all stand even as we respond to, this, uh, to the message and then we're going to pray together. Let us stand as we sing the stand. <laughs> Thank you.
process is indeed a lifetime to take but let us be aware that it is an ongoing thing it's not something that we will postpone for later we are your children we are your followers lord jesus christ help us empower us change us transform us so that we are able to make a stand and live out our faith for your glory. Lord, help Central Baptist Church, not just International Congregation, the Mandarin Congregation, and even the Cantonese Congregations at 9 and 4.30, and even the emerging Thai Fellowship, oh God. I just pray that you will help each and every one of us to be true disciples of Jesus Christ, not just by name, not just by affiliation, not just by membership at Central, but by the way we live our lives daily. Lord, nothing is impossible with you, and so we entrust our lives to you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, Amen and Amen. Again, let me ask you, the time to stand up for Jesus is when? It's now. <laughs> okay. Again, the time to stand up for Jesus is now. Yes. Okay.
It's okay. God will make a way for all of us. God bless you, and may you live to be a true and genuine followers, follower of Jesus Christ every day. God bless you, and may you be a blessing to others as well. Okay, shall we give the Lord praise right now? Yay! It's possible. It's going to be fine, okay? Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. Thank you so much.